I'm David Atkin, Curator of Photography at Notre Dame Snipe Museum of Art. Here are some observations on the museum's exhibition, Touchstones of the 20th Century. I want to talk a little bit about the transformation to photography in the early 20th century brought about by the miniature handheld camera. This is a self-portrait by Edward Steichen, the American photographer who's taking a picture of himself in a mirror with a traditional glass plate camera. You see the scale of the camera and the enormous lens. Behind it is a bellows that separates it from a large plate of glass which holds the light-sensitive silver salts in a film of gelatin. This is a glass. At about the same time, a new, smaller camera came into use. Here's an advertisement for the famous Kodak Brownie held handheld camera. You can see that it's a little box with a small lens on the front. Inside the box, instead of a plate of glass and a single negative, is a roll of plastic film, which is sensitized. And after taking an image, the user turns a crank to move that negative onto a new spool and open up a new negative image. This is Doris Ullman, the American portrait photographer. And I show this just to remind us of the scale of a traditional view camera with its glass plate negative. You'll notice that it is affixed here to a large tripod which keeps the camera still. These two Germans, Ernst Leis Sr. on the left and Oscar Barnack on the right, would introduce a whole new way of making photographs in about 1912 when Barnack began his experiments with the smaller camera which was designed to use the film that cinema projectors used. He convinced Ernst Leitz, who owned an optical company, to provide him with the funds to do experiments with this idea. And this is a prototype camera that he came up with, the so-called Leica camera. This camera is about two and a half inches tall and six inches wide. It has a very small but very high quality lens. And the mechanism in this camera is particularly refined. This camera is made with a watchmaker's precision. So one might compare the Kodak camera with a Leica camera by comparing a Timex watch with a Rolex watch. They both tell time, but one does it with remarkable precision and is engineered to last a lifetime. The negatives that are produced by the Leica camera are necessarily very small. So in order to make larger prints, Barnock made a very precise enlarger. Now, enlargers had been in existence for quite some time, but the lights enlarger had the same kind of mechanical precision that the Leica camera had. Here's an example of an early lights enlarger, and you can see that it has on an adjustable arm, which you can crank up and down to increase or decrease the uh, distance from the bed of the enlarger, another camera, another set of lenses. And in the bulb is a light. 
what you would do is take the developed film and place it underneath the bulb and wind it to a place where the film is above the lens and then flash the light. And the image from the negative would then be projected down onto a piece of sensitized photographic printing paper. In this way, you can make enlargements of different scale. Now, this took a huge shift in conception for professional and amateur photographers, and many just found it impossible to make the shift. When Barnock and Lights started to develop this system, they decided to send it out to famous European photographers to have them test out the prototypes. One of the most famous was Dr. Paul Wolf. Paul Wolf was a German photographer working in Frankfurt in the 1920s, and he had already published several photo books representing different German cities. So he was very skilled at taking his camera into the field. When he took a Leica camera into the field, he found that he could create very dynamic images from points of view and of moving subjects. And this came as a revelation to him. One of Paul Wolf's favorite locations was the Frankfurt railway station, where he found that the effects of light, the changing atmosphere with the steam from steam engines, allowed him to create amazing images. Here's one in which the light coming through the front windows of the Frankfurt station made this incredible effects of illumination. In this photograph, the photograph in our exhibition, Wolf shot a man who just alighted from a train walking down from the platform into the subterranean hallways, and he captured the way that light came behind the figure and fell across the stairs to give you a sense of form and graphic design. In the 1930s, Paul Wolf created an exhibition and wrote a book called My Experiences with the Leica. This exhibition traveled around Germany and was a vehicle by which the lights company advertised the Leica camera and what it could do. And here on the cover of the original book, My Experiences with the Leica, you see a portrait of Paul Wolf holding his camera, and you get a sense of how tiny this camera was. Another German photographer, now working in Paris, who was a recipient of the prototype Leica cameras, was Ilse Bing. And this is her famous self-portrait with the Leica in mirrors, made in 1928. And here you can see that she set up her Leica camera on a tabletop tripod, and she's shooting herself reflected in a mirror that reflects another mirror showing herself from the side, so that the reflections and the sense of space and detail in this image are remarkable. Bing designed it in such a way that the fabric of her costume and the fabric of the draper behind contrasted with these, these reflected images. Remarkable detail is the way that the enormous button on her sleeve is larger than the lens of her Leica camera. Bing took her Leica out into the streets of Paris and found unusual points of view from which to shoot which she could not have done with a large view camera. Here, for example, she looks down on a street sweeper from a bridge over another street. Or here, she looks up into a carnival swing 
in which a couple swings back and forth, holding the cables and pressing with all their might against the swinging gondola. The Russian constructivist painter, sculptor, and designer, Alexander Rodchenko, used the Leica camera in very distinctive ways. He began by using it to photograph geometric images that he then used in his poster designs. Here we see Rodchenko before his sculpture and a painting in a costume designed by his wife, Varova Stepanova. When Rodchenko took the camera out in the streets of Moscow, he found designs that reflected the geometry of his Russian constructivist compositions. Here he holds up his camera to look up into a soaring radio tower. Or here in the photograph in our exhibition, he looks up at the projecting balconies in a high-rise building. Or here, Rodchenko, from another high-rise building, is looking down on figures who are on a balcony below, who are themselves looking down on a parade beneath on the street level. And there, a phalanx of figures is marching together in a geometric position. Later in his career, Rodchenko took his Leica to the circus where he photographed elephants and clowns and acrobats. A great master of the Leica is Henri Cartier-Bresson, a French-born photographer who used his Leica for a very different purpose because Cartier-Bresson was interested in candid photographs, photographs that captured the exact moment when all the elements of a narrative composition came together. Cartier-Bresson used his camera in such a way that people were unaware that they were being photographed. For example, here, a figure who has walked across a ladder-like object and is about to jump over a puddle after a rain in Paris is captured in the very moment just before his heel hits the puddle and disturbs the water, creating a perfect mirror image. Or here, Cartier-Bresson captured the moment when this young boy carrying two bottles of wine home to his parents at dinner very proudly marched along after having impressed a couple of young ladies. Or here in the photograph in our exhibition, Cartier-Bresson is using his miniature camera to take the photograph of a personal and private moment in a cathedral in Lisbon in Portugal, where he is walking by a confessional taking place the side aisle of the cathedral, where a woman leans forward to whisper her confession to the priest. Their two figures create an almost pyramidal shape in black, which connects to this twisted column that becomes almost like a huge cable shooting up into the sky and straight to heaven, where God hears this private confession. Thanks for joining me. This is David Acton, Curator of Photography at the Snipe Museum of Art. Please join us again for observations on our exhibition, Touchstones of the 20th Century.